Hi, I'm Mrs. Brown. I teach history at Robert Eagle Staff Middle School in Seattle Public Schools, and welcome to day two of our lesson. Uh, today is April 22nd, and we are going to talk about what it means to be a land-based people. And this is part of our Tribal Homelands Unit. So thank you so much for joining me today. Last time, we I introduced to you land-based principles. Relationship, knowledge, symbiosis, stewardship. In relationship, land-based people learn about relationships with humans and within the ecosystem through land. The land and the resources and nature teach them uh, about that relationship. Knowledge, all of their knowledge comes from the land. The knowledge, the technology, the science, the, the religion the art, all are taught by the land and nature. And because of this, there's a symbiosis or a symbiotic give and take relationship between land and people. People depend on the land and then the land depends on the people to care for it. And that takes us into principle four, which is stewardship. Stewardship is the sacred responsibility given to land-based people by the creator to care for the land and its resources and all living things for future generations, generations they likely will never meet. I put these, uh, I, I contrasted land-based values with that of what is taught in Judeo-Christian tradition. In the book of Genesis and their sacred text, um, there is a command by their God to have dominion or to dominate or to control the environment. And so I asked you to uh, write about that and to look for examples that you could find in your own life, in your own area. So I did the same thing. And as I looked, I only could take a look at what was around me, right? So that was going to be my house and my neighborhood. And I found that I learn a lot from my cats. I recycle, I, um, I think about the relationship I have with my cats, the only wildlife, I, well, not even wildlife that I have around me right now. And I give them food and shelter and water. They give me companionship and enter entertainment. So that's another example of symbiosis. Uh, <clears throat> an example of Judeo-Christian land values would be dominance over. And so I have some of that value as well. I want strawberries whenever I want them, not when they're in season around me. And so I have in my refrigerator right now, strawberries from Mexico. So I'm controlling in a way my environment and what I have access to. We do that with genetically modified foods. We do that with um, our choice in plastics and uh, and, and so when I take a look at my own land values, which is what I asked you to do, mine are somewhere in between. And that started making me think about something that is really important to emphasize. When I was taking a look at land-based versus Judeo-Christian land values, I thought, well, gosh, I wonder if you might be thinking, do all native people then protect the land? And then do all Christians exploit the land? And I wanted to make very clear that uh, in a word, no. What I was teaching and what I was distinguishing is the origin of those two world values. And so uh, to have any absolutes in that, I think would be inaccurate and unfair. So I wanted to make that clear for you as we continue. Further in our lesson, we talked about a concept about time. If we were going to take a look at this as a timeline, here's our little blip in time since the, uh, the non-native settlement of this continent and the founding of our nation to today. It's just a little blip. And with land-based people, we go back and back and back and our time spirals, spirals down into what we call since time immemorial, since the beginning of time, since the first daylight, since before remembering. 
And so when we are taking a look at Washington state history, we want to make sure that we are not starting here, that we are starting way back here so that we can understand clearly the, uh, the history of the land beneath our feet. So that also means that we also have to take a look at land-based values and where did the people's feet and water come from? And so that is our lesson today. So by the time we're done today, you should be able to name four tribal regions in Cascadia and explain what are called seasonal rounds. And uh, what you're going to need today is something to write with and a packet. If you don't have a packet, just any piece of paper is just fine for you to be able to record your thoughts. Everything that you need for the lesson will be on our presentation today. My entry question for you is, it seems unrelated, but it is, what are calendars for? And so I think about calendars. Well, they are a record of time and we keep track of our time on calendars, when we're supposed to go places, when we're supposed to celebrate things, when we're supposed to do things. We keep track of our day, we keep track of, of pretty much everything that we do and we, and we celebrate. And so I want to introduce our first vocabulary word, which is seasonal round, as a type of calendar. The definition that you have in your packet is a type of seasonal calendar that indicates harvestable resources in a tribal region that I give an example, uh, and I'm going to refer to our last lesson. The Yakima people know that uh, huckleberries are in season when on our sacred mountain, Pato, there is a shape that looks like a horse when it shifts. And so uh, that is knowledge that we get from nature. And so that would be an example of taking a look at a seasonal round when we know things are, are ready. And it happens all in a circle. And I couldn't think of any synonyms. The closest thing that I could think to compare would be a calendar, but calendar does not quite encompass what a seasonal round is. And so that's what we're going to be talking about in further detail. So let's take a look first. I mentioned circle twice so far, and circle is a sacred shape in many native traditions. Circles you see in nature everywhere. Nature itself is a circle, it's a cycle. Our four directions all around us uh, comprise a circle. We take a look at examples, a, a caldera, a cross cut of a tree, the reflection that we get in, a, in a, a body of water. We could even take a look, even though that this uh, bridge is man-made, the sun is round, our earth is round. Uh, when, we, when we see rivulets in still water, they are round, bubbles are round. And so we have uh, we have a, uh, a recognition of that circle as sacred. And so you will see that shape in a lot of native traditions and you'll um, hear about sacred circles in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of native cultures that you might study. So moving on, our next vocabulary word is Cascadia. Cascadia is a proper noun, and it is the name that we give uh, the land that is up around British Columbia area in Canada and down into our state, Washington, and then even further down into Oregon. So uh, we can call that the Pacific Northwest, Northwestern United States. And so uh, I wanted to make sure that you knew that this is where we're studying our area, but not just in Washington state, because Washington has only been a state for a very short, short time when we talk about the history of this land in reference to land-based people. I wanna show you another map that I find quite extraordinary. This map is also a map of Cascadia, but what do you notice about the map? I hope you noticed that Washington right here looks sideways that Oregon looks sideways. And that is because the direction of north is different in this map. Most maps that we're used to seeing have north facing up or at the top of the map. And I think that this is a really powerful example of the way that map makers can influence our perceptions about land. And they then are quite powerful because then they influence how we see the world. And so maps 
that you see, I want you to start considering what those maps mean and how do you think the map maker, just like an author, what are they intending for us to understand and what do they want us to understand and how are they influencing us? So Cascadia, back to Cascadia. The information that I'm going to be presenting today comes from, in part, this book, People of Cascadia by my friend Heidi Bowen. She has several sections on seasonal rounds because they are such an integral part of land-based people's um, lives. And uh, I love this book. This book can be uh, picked up in any library, maybe even your school library. I also put the website there just in case you might wanna take a look at what she has to offer for you. Now, one thing that I wanted to point out and one thing that I wanted to teach you as you take a look at books about Native people, especially when they're not written by Native people. Heidi Bowen is non-Native, and so that should create a red flag in your head. What gives her the authority to be able to write about people that she... Uh, that she has no lineage of, or she has, she is not descended from. And so then you start looking. All good readers are gonna be looking for the authority. First of all, she has two elders from two different tribes, Makah and Suquamish. First of all, they gave her permission. And so I want you to think about the stories, the art, and the history as what we call intellectual property. When we borrow other people's information, we need to ask permission. And we do so especially when, it, uh, when we think about land-based and tribal people. That is their history, their art, their language, uh, their stories to tell. And so we always need to ask permission. And Heidi was very careful to provide information to show why she was allowed to, to uh, write and illustrate this book. But she moves on. She had edits and uh, other collaboration from Snoqualmie, Lummi, Tlingit, and Haida, and other tribes. And so that lets me know as a reader that it wasn't just one or two people that took a look at the several tribal people because every tribe has a distinct history, culture, tradition, stories, and art, and religion. Further, she did have some non-tribal collaboration. She, um, she, uh, there was a North Cascades archeologist and students and teachers that she also consulted. And so I have come to trust this author. This author has convinced me that she is an authority. And so I can take a look at this book as, as valid and useful and honest. In Heidi's book, this is one of her maps that she illustrated. You can see the four major cultures. Now, in elementary school, you were likely taught that there were two major cultural areas, coastal and plateau. And that's just an oversimplification of the complexities of the tribal groups and nations and cultures that we have in the Northwest in Cascadia. So the first that we uh, take a look at is the Waukeshan. So she says Waukeshan for coastal. That's because it's a language distinction. And so the Waukeshan speaking people are in the coast. So you see the coast here up around British Columbia. This is the tip of Washington, the Olympic Peninsula. And so you can see the area here of Macaw. And then you might even have down a little bit further. This is Heidi's interpretation again as a map maker. And so you might see other maps that have slightly different uh, boundaries. The second is Coast Salish. Uh, the language group is Salishan. And we also call this the Salish Sea. This interior salt water here is known as the Salish Sea. And this is the area around Puget Sound. So we have lower Puget Sound right here. And then the third is the Plateau. They are Sahaptan people, uh, excuse me, Sahaptan speaking people. And, uh, and then we have the Chinookan, the Chinookan language, and those are also known as the Lower Columbia when we're taking a look at the geographic region. I ask you to then take Heidi's map 
and take a map that's in your packet to shade in those areas so that when you take a look at a typical map of Washington that you're going to see as you study Washington state history and beyond, that you can see where these, where these uh, tribal cultural groups are. You can see the coast right there uh, along the Olympic Peninsula, the Salish Sea area we know as the Lower Puget Sound region, the Lower Columbia we have right here, and then the Sahapton Plateau area. And I just kind of penciled in the, the geographic regions as they are presented in middle school, just so that you have a, so that you have a clear idea. So you have Waukeshan, Coast Salish, Sahapton, and Chinookan. So this gives us a reference of the land and the people in it that we're going to be discussing and studying today. On another page in Heidi's book, she has an illustration of what is a seasonal round. Remember I said seasonal round is a calendar and she even points out in her book that it's a calendar. And so let me explain how the calendar works. If you think about this as a center right here and that you have these wedges emanating or radiating from the center, that gives you an idea of the way the, the seasonal round works and how you should be reading it. You also read it in a clockwise fashion. And so we can see the winter, not a lot, maybe some mountain goat, but in late winter, we have harvestable species here, plants and animals and fish. And then we move along the seasonal round all the way around to late fall and early winter. And all of these species are harvested and harvested at certain times and they are indicators that lead into yet another season and yet another season and yet another season and so this definitely is a calendar so when I ask you about how is a seasonal round like a calendar it is it measures time right we have time here it tells people when to do things so we have that as well and so this is just a general seasonal round. There are more seasonal rounds and next time we will be dis we will be discussing and further exploring those. But let me do a read aloud for seasonal rounds from Heidi to explain a little bit more in detail what they are. She starts with the people of Cascadia were entirely interconnected with the natural world around them. I'm gonna stop there for a second because I want you to pay attention to where you can find evidence of the four principles of land-based people. And when I started reading, I thought, well, the first thing is right there, right? Interconnectedness. And so which principle? That could be symbiotic relationships. That could be that could be also the stewardship. But I am recognizing as a reader these four principles. They wore soft furs, wool, feathers from animals they shared their homeland with, along with fibers and plants from the forest. Now here's the thing that's really interesting, and it shows yet more evidence of land-based values is that these people shared the homeland. Again, they were not dominating, not in control, but sharing the homeland with all of the species, including the plants. They made their homes from trees that came from great forests of the land that traveled in canoes and made from the finest trees. They harvested huge quantities of food to store for the long rainy winters in containers made from bark and wood, and they healed themselves with special herbs barks and roots. Their spiritual life was deeply connected to the natural life around them. So we see here that symbiosis, we see just part of it, how humans depend on the world and the land. And then we also see down here with relationships, with spiritual life, spiritual life, uh, com uh, very connected with the natural world. She moves on to talk about species in particular. And she says that the mountain goats live high in the Cascades. They provide wool. The salmon run the rivers in the millions and elk are the size of a cow. 
There are plentiful berries, new shoots, greens, nutritious roots, bulbs, and tubers, and all kind to store for the winter. So we have examples of those species through here. She moves on to talk about to harvest, in order to harvest enough of these many resources for warmth, shelter, food, medicine, and ornament, the people were keenly aware of the seasonal progression of ripening. They knew which foods were ready as one traveled higher into the mountains or out to the islands. They harvested these resources in what is called the seasonal rounds, each season filled with harvests of different kinds throughout the circle of the year. And she mentioned the circle as well. So I'm wondering if as a reader, you can take a look and you can find evidence of one of those, one or more of those land-based principles. Now, I'm sure that you found quite a few. The one that stuck out for me was this one right here, people being keenly aware, that knowledge that they learn from the natural world, from the nature around them, and so how they are able to survive and how they are able to thrive as a people come from nature. Now, there are other parts of the seasonal realm that we're going to discuss. Just like a calendar that you have on your phone or in your classroom or in your house, the calendar is the calendar of a year, but then it's divided, right? It's divided into months. And those months are named September through August. In fact, you have, uh, you have some months that are named even after people, July for Julius Caesar, August for Augustus Caesar. And the months on a seasonal round are named something different and something I find a bit more practical and a bit more appropriate. They're named for what they reveal in terms of the seasonal round. And let me tell you a little bit more about what that means. The cycle of a moon is about a month. And so the months were not called months, they were called moons. And so we're going to read just a little bit about the, the moons and the seasonal rounds. I'm gonna read directly from Heidi's book. And she says some very, uh, very interesting, informative things. She says that each lunar cycle from the new moon to new moon represents a lunar month in the Northwest calendar. Each moon is named for its relationship to the seasonal rounds of daily life in the village. For the Coast Salish, these include the summer berry moons, elk calling moon, digging moon, and silver salmon moon. Each group named their moons in accordance with their seasonal rounds calendar. And so you can see the months are named in, in terms of, of what they reveal, in terms of those times of the year. She goes on further to talk about seasonal indicators. She says that the first song of the Pacific horse frog means that the warming time has begun and the new shoots will soon be ready for harvest, beginning a new year of seasonal rounds of food gathering. So the new year in a seasonal round begins with the, the ending of winter and the beginning of a new growing season. That seems to make a whole lot more sense to me as a, as a human being because you're taking a look at what is new and so therefore a new year has begun. She says that people knew when it was time to harvest certain plants and animals by observing signs in nature. When nettle is knee high and thimbleberry shoots are ready for harvest, it's time to go to the seashore to harvest seaweed. When the flowering dogwood is in peak bloom, it is time to go down to the bay to harvest the sweetest clams. When red alder has leafed out, it is time to pull the cedar bark for baskets and clothes. The bird song of thrush ripens the salmon berries, which is a sign that the salmon are returning. And she moves, and then she goes on to discuss those various indicators. And she says something here. She says that it, it is these indicators, these seasonal indicators that tell land-based people when it's time to go to work, when it's time to move to certain areas for harvesting, when it's time to start preparing for winter, when it is time to gather all kinds of foods that are provided by the land. She says that all these and more are seasonal indicators for seasonal rounds of gathering in Cascadia. 
And so when we take a look at the seasonal round, we can take a look at all of these areas here, all of these species as seasonal indicators. When land-based people know when to not only harvest, but also to care for these resources. Remember I said that one of the principles is stewardship and that stewardship talks about, about protecting and managing the environment in such a way that, that generations and generations will be able to share in the same abundance that we do in the present. And so when we take a look at that, that, uh, that is one of the principles that we see in a seasonal round, but it's not outrightly stated. So let's just do a little bit of review. How is a seasonal round like a calendar? And I'm hoping that as you think back to what we've just been talking about, is that you see that they measure time, that they keep track of jobs and duties and time throughout the year, and that they remind us of when we need to get things done. And then, how are land-based principles reflected in seasonal rounds? This was something that was just a little bit, uh, a little bit more difficult. You had to take a look at our last lesson principles and be able to infer and be able to find evidence. And so through our reading and through my talks with you, you found interconnectedness of the people, you found seasonal indicators, you found spiritual life connecting to the natural life, and then that, again, that inferred caring of the environment, taking a look at that stewardship. Now, as we look into our next, our next lesson, I mentioned four tribal regions in Cascadia, and I hope that you can remember what they are. At least you can recognize them. So we have Coast Salish, and remember, that was the Salishan language group. And then we have Coastal, which is the Waukeshan language group. And then we have Plateau, the Sahaptan language group. And then we have the Lower Columbia, which is the Chinookan language group. And if we have different geographic and, and tribal and cultural regions here, how many seasonal rounds do you think that there would be in Cascadia? Well, generally, when you take a look at those four regions, it makes sense to know that we have at least four seasonal rounds. And we're gonna go into those into detail as we head into our next lesson. In our next lesson, we're going to be talking about those seasonal rounds. How are they alike? How are they different? And then we're gonna be taking a look at what, what the food and the seasonal indicators, what they mean, how together they impact the collective identity of a tribe or a region, and how they can also support a sense of belonging. And so I hope you will join me next time to study in more detail seasonal rounds, the people of Cascadia, and how land-based people have survived in this land since the beginning of time, since time immemorial. Thank you.